Tonight, Ottawa orders the shooting down of an unidentified object over at Yukon. A joint U.S.-Canada operation leads to action by NORAD. Posed a reasonable threat to the safety of civilian flight. The rush to recover the remnants and identify any potential threat. Being used to test us or to poke a stick in our eye. Toronto City politics tossed into turmoil. I think it's really inappropriate as a leader. The mayor's affair and the implications. Plus, Indigenous communities call out Alberta's premier. I expect an apology from her. Danielle Smith's version of Canada's origins creates a commotion. CTV National News with Sandy Ronaldo. Good evening. 24 hours after American fighter jet shot down an unidentified object over Alaska, another one was shot down today, this time inside Canadian airspace. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau confirmed that at 3.41 p.m. Eastern today, an American F-22 under NORAD command took down a flying object over central Yukon on his orders and with U.S. support. A posted notice places a strike north of Whitehorse and east of the Alaskan border within a 185-kilometer radius. The debris will now be collected and analyzed by the Canadian military. As CTV's Annie Bergeron Oliver reports, it's a third such strike in North American space in a week. Canadian and American fighter jets scrambled again today, deployed by NORAD to destroy another unmanned object. This time, the missile from a U.S. F-22 fired in Canada at the Prime Minister's request. An aviation alert at 4 p.m. Eastern, warning of a potential hazard north of Whitehorse. The object was flying at an altitude of approximately 40,000 feet, had unlawfully entered Canadian airspace, and posed a reasonable threat to the safety of civilian flight. The defense minister says the small cylindrical object was downed about 160 kilometers from the Canadian-U.S. border in central Yukon. But its origins and what the object was capable of remains unknown. The importance of this moment should not be underestimated. We detected this object together and we defeated this object together. The downing is believed to be a first for Nora. Um, order by the Canadian government to shoot down uh, an asset in Canadian airspace has not occurred. But while unprecedented, this former NORAD director of operations says until recent technology upgrades, similar objects were likely missed. We're seeing more detection of assets that would have, to, to be quite honest, flown under the radar due to their speed or you know, being hidden in the, in the back clutter of other data on the systems. The timing is being considered suspicious. NORAD had been tracking the object over the last 24 hours, and during part of that time, it was also monitoring another object the size of a car. It was shot down Friday near the Alaska-Canada border. Those instances come as questions continue to swirl about the Chinese spy balloon that was destroyed last week near the Carolina coast. It's quite possible that the, both of these two new objects came from a, a different party, and were perhaps uh, being used to test us or to poke a stick in our eye. And that's certainly something that uh, the Russians would want to do. The object was first tracked yesterday, but the defense minister says the pilots needed to wait until daylight to get a visual confirmation, Sandy, and the ability to missile lock. All right, Annie, thank you for this. Reaction has been swift to the stunning resignation of Toronto Mayor John Tory after his public acknowledgement of an inappropriate relationship with a much younger staffer. City Hall is scrambling to stay on political course as newspapers around the world pick up the story. Just look at the headlines of the Washington Post, New York Times and the London Guardian. CTV's Austin Delaney now on how the city moves forward after scandal. Canada's biggest city is coming to grips today with a bombshell dropped by its mayor last evening. During the pandemic, I developed a relationship with an employee in my office in a way that did not meet the standards to which I hold myself as mayor and as a family man. On board a streetcar, there is shock at the sudden turn of events. It's kind of embarrassing. And also unexpected for him because it wasn't really in character what 
what his public image was. Never one for a life of politics herself, Tory's wife, Barbara Hackett, was by his side when Tory won in 2014, and again by his side election night four years later. But if there was any hint of a crack in the relationship, it might have been spotted when he won his third term this past October. His wife and family were nowhere to be seen on stage during his acceptance speech. And she was not by his side last night during Tory's shocking revelation that he'd been in a relationship with a former staffer more than half his age. It came at a time when Barb, my wife of 40 plus years, and I were enduring many lengthy periods apart while I carried out my responsibilities during the pandemic. Tory's abrupt resignation comes a little over three months since sweeping into a third term. He was campaigning for re-election. He knew full well what he had done and nonetheless decided to continue on as mayor and seek re-election. Political pundits agree Tory had no choice but to step away from the job he loved. And I think John Tory comes from a sort of a school of thought that I did something wrong, I screwed up and I have to take responsibility for it. Ontario's Doug Ford, who ran against Tory for mayor in 2014, released a statement that reads in part, he united Toronto behind an optimistic vision for the future and I will miss working with him to see it come to life. With Tory stepping down, his deputy mayor, Jennifer McKelvey, steps into the role as interim mayor. While the city prepares for a by-election, McKelvey, an environmental geoscientist by trade, is seen as a Tory ally and will steer the council through next week's budget debate while potential mayoral candidates test the waters. It's happening already. I can tell you I've heard from people. Folks are going to run for mayor. The question tonight, what sort of legacy will Tory leave behind? One who led the city through the pandemic or one who threw the future of Canada's largest city in flux? Sandy? CTV's Austin Delaney. Thank you, Austin. Well, the Toronto Star newspaper broke the story of the affair yesterday, shortly before John Tory announced that he would be stepping down as mayor. Joining us now is Alicia Hashem, Toronto Star City Hall reporter. Alicia, we're fascinated by the backstory here. How did the Star learn about the relationship between the mayor, uh, mayor rather, and a former staffer? You know, late last year we learned um, through a tip that the mayor's marriage was in trouble, but it was only earlier this month that we got credible information that he was potentially having an affair with a former staffer. And so that's when the stars sort of really kicked into gear, working uh, sources to figure out, did this start when the uh, young woman in question was working directly for the mayor? And that itself is, is what the key is here. Is it not in any investigation that this is more than an affair between a married man and a much younger woman? So talk to us about the real issue here and the implications of their relationship. I mean, the mayor is the, arguably the most powerful man in Toronto. This is a young woman who worked in his office directly in his employ. I mean, there's a, naturally a, an inescapable power imbalance there. And, you know, we have to remember that this is an elected official. We have to investigate whether um, anything inappropriate happened there. It raises all kinds of questions about workplace propriety, sexual harassment, and um, any number of questions that I think an elected official really has to answer to. You. All right, the Toronto Star's Alicia Hasham. Alicia, thank you for this. And CTV News is following the unraveling of the mayor's career and the reaction to the shocking turn of events. You can find it all on ctvnews.ca. Well, more than 28,000 lives are confirmed lost five days after powerful earthquakes toppled thousands of buildings in Turkey and Syria. The search for survivors has now become a desperate race against the clock. Rescue crews face unstable conditions. In this case, several are buried under an avalanche of debris. And as CTV's Tom Walters reports from Turkey, they're also battling geopolitical challenges. It was a quake powerful enough to crack the earth. New pictures show a Turkish olive grove split in two by a fissure 200 meters wide and 30 meters deep. But figuratively, at least, there is an even bigger chasm between two nations hit by the same disaster. In Turkey, the U.S. military helps unload tons of supplies flown in on German transports. All told, there are rescue workers here from 68 countries, including this team from Burnaby, B.C. In Syria, President Bashar al-Assad today gave thanks to humanitarian aid workers from Russia. 
What you've done here is great work because it's the first time in Syria to have such a disaster. In fact, many accuse Russia of choking off aid to help Assad fight a bloody civil war. In territory held by anti-Assad rebels, some four million people are dependent on humanitarian aid. Assad has used that as a weapon by allowing only a trickle to get through by just one open border crossing. Russia has helped him keep others closed. On Thursday, fuel tanker driver Ahmed Khalil said, I've been waiting for eight hours and they won't let us cross the border. And while the UN says one earthquake relief convoy did get through, the head of the rebel civil defense force, the White Helmets, says that was just a regular pre-quake aid shipment that was delayed. We have to get access. We have to be able to reach the affected population. The Syrian government is finally saying that it will allow aid deliveries to rebel territory, but there's plenty of skepticism about that assurance. Sandy? CTV's Tom Walters in Turkey. Tom, thank you. Ukraine's president today stopped by Turkey's embassy in Kyiv to pay his respects to the victims of the devastating quakes. Volodymyr Zelensky laid flowers at a memorial inside the mission. The war-torn country has already contributed 87 rescue personnel to Turkey. Zelensky's visit took place the same day Russia launched another huge offensive against Ukraine's power plants. <laughs> Residents ran for cover as more than 100 cruise missiles paired with artillery and airstrikes were launched across Ukraine, resulting in widespread blackouts. More controversy tonight for Alberta's premier after Danielle Smith released a video of herself on Parliament Hill reflecting on Canada's origins. The politician's interpretation of history is not sitting well with Indigenous groups. They call Smith's social media post dehumanizing, demoralizing and hurtful. And as CTV's Alberta Bureau Chief Bill Fortier reports, they want an apology. The now infamously awkward handshake wasn't the only moment during Danielle Smith's trip to Ottawa this past week raising eyebrows. I came to Ottawa to advocate for Albertans. The Alberta Premier also shot this video in front of the Parliament buildings where she said this about Canada's history. Many years ago, the Indigenous people of this land and those that came from across the world united to tame an unforgiving frontier. If she can't even have truth, we certainly can't have reconciliation. Smith's characterization of Canada's past is seen as inaccurate by many given the brutal colonial legacy of residential schools and other discriminatory laws and policies. If she knows anything about that history, she ought to know that what she's saying is a bold-faced lie. This was not an off-the-cuff moment, right? This was a scripted video uh, with a message that she wanted to deliver, and it's just so historically inaccurate. Smith has come under fire from Indigenous groups in the past for her unproven claims of Cherokee heritage and for a comment four months ago about unvaccinated Canadians. So they have been the most discriminated against group that I've ever witnessed in my lifetime. When you've got the Premier of the province unaware of the history of Canada, I think it's a problem. I think it's a major blind spot. Some are now calling on the Premier to take back her words. I expect um, the UCP caucus to condemn her statements. I expect an apology from her. The Premier's office sent a statement defending its track record on Indigenous issues, but it did not answer our questions on whether the Premier would, in fact, apologize or retract her version of history. Sandy. Bill, thank you for this. Coming up after the break, disappointment in the forecast. I'd skate to work. I love it. I would go every day if it was open. Warm winter weather cancels the Canadian tradition, plus the drama off the pitch heats up. Much anticipation over tomorrow's 57th Super Bowl between the Philadelphia Eagles and Kansas City Chiefs. Officials are not taking any chances and have beefed up security to supersized levels. More than a million football fans are expected in and around the stadium in Glendale, Arizona. Several U.S. federal agencies are teaming up to evaluate potential threats. The risks uh, can be simple and they can be sophisticated. 
Helicopters, boots on the ground, and hundreds of cameras will work in tandem to protect fans and players. While facing the threat of legal action from Canada Soccer, members of the Canadian women's soccer team are returning to the pitch tomorrow after going on strike over pay equity issues and budget cuts. Players boycotted today's training session in Florida ahead of emergency labour talks with Canada Soccer. But the team was told their job action was unlawful and Canada Soccer threatened to sue the players and their union. Well, people hoping to show up and skate on the world's largest rink will be disappointed. Warmer temperatures than usual are keeping Ottawa's famous Rideau Canal from freezing over. And as CTV's Kevin Gallagher reports, the changing climate means extended closures could soon become the norm for this quintessential tourist attraction. Refrigerated outdoor rinks like this one could be the closest skaters get to the Rideau Canal this year. As Ottawa's third warmest winter on record has kept the world's largest outdoor rink off limits. I'd skate to work. I love it. I would go every day if it was open. For the first time since it opened in 1971, the canal could stay closed all winter. To make the ice safe, at least 10 days of minus 10 or colder are needed. And that simply isn't in the forecast. The odds of it happening this coming week, slim to nil. Uh, because we know that it's going to continue to be mild, milder than average for the next little while, and we have another rain event next Friday. While some still hold out hope an unexpected Arctic blast could come to the rescue, the annual Ice Dragon Boat Festival to raise money for charity has already been cancelled. With 70% of the uh, total attendance coming from out of town and flights and so on, it just wasn't going to work. As the potential of a skate-free winter on the canal starts to sink in, there are concerns that climate change could make it a more regular occurrence in the future. A report from the National Capital Commission predicts if global emissions remain high, winters in Ottawa will be four weeks shorter by next decade, with 20% fewer days below minus 10. It's easy to be flippant and say, who wouldn't want a little, a few more warmer days in the winter, but that's not the case. We, we do need winter to, we need those, those cold temperatures to freeze the Rideau Canal. The NCC has tried using slush cannons to help cool the canal, but without more seasonal temperatures, the iconic iceway will continue to thaw. Kevin Gallagher, CTV News, Ottawa. Still ahead, the long and winding road for a team far from home. Victory tonight for a young team that fled the war in Ukraine. The preteen refugees are competing in the biggest peewee hockey tournament in the world. And tonight, they trounced the Boston Junior Bruins. Here's CTV's Kelly Gregg on a memorable debut in Quebec City. A moment bigger than the game. A team from Ukraine and the U.S. linked arm in arm for the Ukrainian national anthem. These 11 and 12 year olds are Ukrainian refugees. Scattered across Europe during the war, they came together in Quebec City to represent their country. For some who were forced to flee during shelling, it was an overwhelming moment. The first moment, it was so scary. I look uh, up and too many people look at me and my team. Around 15,000 screaming fans showed their support. It's very important for me to support and to show these kids, to try to give my contribution. Like most teams, the Ukrainians are staying with billet families in Quebec. It's a chance for them to learn about each other and for the players to just be kids away from the war. We'll pass to McDonald's because they're 12 year old boys. They want to go to McDonald's and they say McDonald's has been closed since the war back home. But at the end of the day, I think all the billet families, I think we are unanimous about this. We want to offer them a break from the war. Although they went down early, the Ukrainians battled back to win three to one. When we arrived in Canada, we already was happy. It was amazing. And especially now to play in this game like this, it's, it's unbelievable. A dream comes true. And in a moment, both teams describe as unforgettable. The players skated together, flags in hand, showing that despite being on opposite sides of the ice and the world, hockey can bring them together. 
Kelly Gregg, CTV News, Quebec City. After the break, custom creations for an occasion that is occasionally bittersweet. We leave you tonight with the story of a dress designer who creates custom bridal gowns, not just because she loves to make beautiful things, but because Lily Kennedy loves a good love story. She was inspired by her parents' passion for one another. And as we hear from CTV's Adam Sawatsky, part of what Lily does is bring light when life sometimes turns dark. It's no surprise Lily Kennedy grew up to create custom wedding dresses for a living. I love love, like I love love. I've watched true love my whole life. Not only did Lily's parents fall in love at first sight, when her mom Susan left for a trip a few days later, Nicholas wrote a letter to her every day until she came home. They were engaged six weeks later. Like my whole life, he would say to me like, look how beautiful she is. Nicholas expressed countless caring words to Susan over the decades until Alzheimer's robbed him of all of them, but three. <laughs> And the only thing he says is, I love you, to my mom. Which brings us to when Lily happened to hear about Donnie and Candy, an engaged couple too overwhelmed by a terminal cancer diagnosis to say I do, and contacted them. And I said, hey, I don't want to overstep at all, but I wondered if you wanted me and everybody I know to put on a wedding for you. And I was like, in tears. <laughs> it was the, a relief from sitting in that somberness of her under our roof in hospice. Lily rallied a team of professionals to donate all their goods and services and stage a ceremony for Candy and Donnie in just four days. Everything else was forgotten about. It was amazing. That was something that she gifted from her heart. While Candy died a month later, Donnie says the joyful memories their family made that day endure. If you can help somebody or make somebody's day amazing, why wouldn't you? Since then, Lily's organized free weddings for three other couples in similar situations and launched Anna's Angels, an official venture that condenses years of planning into days and donates tens of thousands worth of work so love can be celebrated in a big way before it's too late. They don't have every day to look forward to. They just need one special happy day. Which brings us back to Lily's dad, who moments before taking his final breath somehow found a way to not just say three words to his Susan, but four. He was like, I'll love you forever. And because of Lily Kennedy, despite a couple's darkest days, these brightest memories will last forever too. Adam Swatsky, CTV News, Saanich. That's our newscast for this Saturday. Thank you for sharing your time with us. I'm Sandy Ronaldo. Good night until tomorrow.